Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Ioannidis, the Assistant Dean for the Online LLM Program at University of Dayton School of Law. I would like to welcome all of you to the third webinar in our series, Tech Law Insights Navigating the Digital Frontier. Today's webinar will focus on the use of artificial intelligence in law practice. Our panel includes law professors from the University of Dayton School of Law, as well as corporate vice presidents and in-house counsels. Professor Ianello will first provide us with a high-level overview on this topic. Professor Seeger will address some of the upsides of the AI revolution while also analogizing AI to past tech disruptors such as telephones, automobiles, assembly lines, and the internet, and the legal adaptations that followed. In-house counsels Felicitas Lauro and Monica Hayes will share their practice-oriented perspectives on the use of AI and technology in the legal profession. Finally, Professor Tabo will discuss some of the ethical implications for lawyers using these types of technology in U.S. law practice. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all our online LLM students and graduates joining from around the world, as well as to our university partners. We are recording today's presentation and plan to post the recording on the website page for this series. I'll enter that link into the chat shortly. We encourage you to visit that page as well if you're interested in reviewing supplemental resources and reading materials on the topic we'll be discussing today. We'll host our final webinar in this series in March. Our focus will be on LLM career opportunities in the field of law and technology. We really hope you'll join us for that. Today's webinar is meant to be interactive, so please feel free to submit questions through the chat during the presentations. We also will have an opportunity for live Q&A at the end of the presentation. At that time, we will stop the recording. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you once again and turn things over to Professor and Director of the Program in Law and Technology at Dayton Law, Pablo Ianello. Okay, uh, good morning, good evening to everyone, depending on which part of the world are you. Uh, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, I would like to, of course, thank uh, Margaret, and especially to our panelists uh, today, uh, Professor Nicholas Seeger, Professor Tamara Tabu, Felicita Chabro, and Monica Higgs. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just brief uh, provide kind of a landmark information about what are we going to discuss today. Uh, needless to say that artificial intelligence is a trending topic nowadays. Uh, a lot of headlines, uh, a lot of news, comings and goings, legislations passed in the European Union, um, and people talking about how artificial intelligence is affecting academia, uh, other aspects of our life. But we wanted to focus on some of the aspect of artificial intelligence and some kind of artificial intelligence specifically, and take a look how uh, artificial intelligence is affecting a legal practice, okay? Um, legal practice is not ex accepted from the impact of this kind of technology. Um, so briefly, um, I just wanted to give you an idea of what are we talking about, which kind of artificial intelligence are we going to address? So um, there are many type of artificial intelligence, okay? And uh, we are not going to address all kinds of artificial intelligence today. This is one thing. Uh, another thing is artificial intelligence is uh, a way of solving problems. One kind of artificial intelligence that is really relevant for a legal profession is the one that is linked with certain type of machine learning process. So um, I don't want to get too technical into this, but for those of you that are just grasping the topic uh, in the very beginning, you need to think of an artificial intelligence uh, as a box, it's an empty box that we put some instruction into the box and then we will provide material in the box uh, so that 
with our instruction, the, bo the box can perform certain tasks. Now you might be wondering, okay, what's the difference between this and some old computer program? Well, long story short, the thing is that uh, we can provide ways in which this box with the instructions that we provide at the very beginning can begin to learn by themselves. Okay, these little boxes can start learning. Okay, this is something different because up to now, the only ones with a kind of a learning perspective were human beings. This is an artificial way of learning. That's why we call it artificial intelligence. Now, wh whether this is intelligence or not is for another discussion. Uh, this is kind of a revolution um, and something uh, that is affecting all aspects of our life and it will affect all aspects of our life. But as I said, today we wanted to focus on how this is going to uh, impact in a legal profession. And in order to do that, a good way of starting would be uh, to have a historical perspective uh, in order to get a better understanding on how we reach this point and which are the challenges that we are facing today. In order to do that, uh, Professor Nicolas Seeger will, ha he has put together uh, a very good uh, set of slides um, and he will share with us uh, this perspective. So with that being said, uh, I will give the floor to Professor Nicolas Seeger. He is um, a professor at the University of Dayton School of Law uh, on professional success. And he kindly accepted to be here with us today. And Professor Seeger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Professor Ianello, and um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for having me to speak with you. I find this to be a really interesting and important topic right now. As Professor Ianello stated, um, I think that we are in the middle of, at the beginning of a real revolution in AI. And so I want to talk a little bit about how I think that artificial intelligence is going to change the way that we do business, the way that we interact with each other as a society. And um, as lawyers, it's our job to not only understand how we can use AI, how we must use AI, as Professor Tamara Table will talk about momentarily, but also how our clients are going to perceive and use AI. To be competent attorneys, we need to be anticipating issues that are going to arise in the future. And so that seems like a lot because we don't have a lot of perspective um, right now or a lot of experience with AI right now, at least most of us do not. Um, but we can look to past examples of, as Professor Ianello stated, tech disruptors that we've seen in the past to kind of say, we might not have seen this exact situation before, but we've seen enough similar situations in the past that we can kind of try to figure out where these issues are going to arise and what we need to do. So one thing that I think that we can all agree on is that we hope and we really believe that AI will produce and promote efficiency and productivity, both for us as attorneys in drafting documents and doing document review in researching and in creating work product for our clients. Um, but also it's going to create greater efficiencies in business. You know, we're going to save our clients are going to be saving billions of dollars using these types of I'm sorry, can you see my slides? OK. Um, now, we now we can. Now, okay, okay. I'm so sorry about that. Um, maybe I was sharing the wrong screen, but in any event, you haven't missed out on much uh, from my slides. So, but and so we're going to have businesses working differently. The way that they interact with consumers and the way that businesses interact with each other is going to change. And what this, I think, is going to do is free up a lot of human bandwidth for higher level tasks. And so, um, and what does that mean? So some of the lower level tasks, such as creating contracts and entering into contracts with consumers, that might be more automated in the future. Even things that we used to think of as inherently human types of tasks, like hiring um, new employees and evaluating performance, creating reports, analyzing data and things like that, those are going to be um, fairly highly automated in the future. And so I think about that as a good thing because then it frees up us as attorneys, us as business leaders to look at that information more critically. But it also will cause a lot of potentially unforeseen issues to arise. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, 
OK, so here I have kind of a list of past tech disruptors that I think would be great to think about and think about how these different disruptors probably changed business and therefore changed the practice of law. And so if you're thinking about the printing press, we're going from people handwriting books to the written word being disseminated widely. And so this increased, of course, the way that we do business, you know, legal opinions being written and disseminated contracts being written um, more than just having the oral contracts and things like that. Um, general liter literacy and intelligence um, in increasing throughout society. Society. The steam engine creating the availability of goods in um, telephones, allowing us to contract and do business instantaneously from very, very far away. The automobile also allowing us to ship, ship um, materials and goods farther and wider and faster than we ever have before. Um, the assembly line coming in and um, Henry Ford perfecting that and creating cheaper goods that then can be disseminated to more people at, um, at better costs. And the robot assembly line kind of taking that a step further and automating part of that process. Cloud-based computing, you know, no longer do we have to really um, invest in that infrastructure at our own business. We can outsource that, but that creates its own set of problems. And so how did lawyers and how did society adapt to these different types of tech disruptors in the past and then how can we think about those as we kind of anticipate what artificial intelligence is going to um, to do with us in society now next slide please okay so i've kind of lumped these together to make them a little bit easier to talk about but if we think about the telephone and the automobile that had one effect on business was um, that long distance and instantaneous contracting could um, could occur much more easily. Um, we suddenly have businesses in New York shipping goods throughout the whole country. People are injured in California, and those people in California want to go want to say, "Okay, New York company, come to California." and defend this lawsuit where I live and where I was injured. And those companies, of course, are going to say, no, we didn't, we didn't really do business with you there. Um, we're doing business in New York. And so we had attorneys who had to go and argue to the Supreme Court and say, listen, it would only be fair under our notions of due process in the United States to let me sue in California. Um, if we can go back to that. Oh, sorry, you're, you're fine there. Um, and so we had to kind of think about, you know, where are we going to be allowed to sue? What law is going to apply as we ship goods? Say you have a manufacturer in New York, retailers throughout the country, uh, maybe a secondary retailer uh, who sells again to somebody else in, in California or let's say Alaska. And so you have these goods moving through this stream of commerce. What law should apply? You know, And these are not, I don't mean to say that these were new issues when the telephone or the automobile came around, um, but they required us to adapt as attorneys and as a society to kind of say, where are we going to essentially shift these burdens? And so thinking about that assembly line, along with shipping goods, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles, getting things places much, much faster. And once upon a time, we had a legal structure in tort law that primarily focused on fault, right? And at some point, our society through lawyers said, wait a minute, this doesn't really make sense anymore, right? We have these goods that are cheaply made by these companies who are making billions and they're shipping them to every state in the United States and they're hurting people sometimes. And kind of in our minds, we're thinking, well, it's only fair for that company to pay for that harm cost. If that company acted perfectly, that is as reasonably as they could in creating that product, they weren't really at fault. And so that injured consumer would have no recourse against the company, although they were hurt. Well, along comes strict product liability, right? So this is the idea that if you manufacture something improperly, you design it improperly and it hurts somebody, um, we can have liability down the line, even if we determine that at the time that company was acting reasonably. All right, so it's a strict liability. And so we're kind of seeing as our society changes, our law is adapting. And all of that is through lawyers. So we're shifting kind of the burden a little bit from consumers to 
those businesses to say it's in this scope, in this system, it's really only fair for you to take on some of this economic harm if you are getting that economic benefit, right? Uh, thinking about the internet and cloud-based computing, I mean, the internet has changed the way that we live. Um, and, and I'm old enough to remember a time where you couldn't really get on the internet very easily um, or at all. But now it's so accessible. You know, we can buy and sell things. And for the first time, we're seeing um, or thinking about data as being a good, something that we consume and we sell. And so the laws have had to change. You know, lawyers had to advocate for changing those data protection laws to say, under certain circumstances, no, you cannot use this data or we need to protect consumers from these um, from predatory practices online by businesses, things like that. How do we even form a contract online? If I set up a, a website and you come to that website, have, have I really made you an offer? How do you accept that offer and what terms are going to apply? And so we're not reinventing contract law, but we certainly have to had to adapt to, to say, this is how we form the contract. These will be the terms and this is where liability will lie. And that took a lot of lawyers to try to figure that out. But what I want to point out is, Along the lines here, some lawyer had to, um, and, and a group of lawyers really, had, had to kind of look at all of these things and say, our business is changing. The way that we are going to potentially look at the burdens and the risks in our society might also change. Um, what problems can I foresee that my client might have? If I'm working on behalf of that business, what potential litigation risks should I be looking at down the road? Should I be anticipating? Your clients are going to expect that type of brainstorming and that type of creativity in this space. If you're, on the other hand, representing those consumers, you'll be thinking, you know, how can I convince courts to shift that burden, perhaps to businesses, to allow for compensation in areas they haven't before? And so we're already seeing this within AI a little bit so far as we see laws related to hiring and the fact that AI, because we train it, can be trained to be highly discriminatory. And so should we have fault? Should we allow somebody to recover if AI is going to discriminate in hiring? I mean, somebody created the AI, but nobody was sitting there intentionally discriminating, but it was there. And so we're having laws, um, are, we already have laws passed in, in states and, and the federal government that um, are saying we need to think about and protect those interests. And so as we move forward, and I will conclude with this next slide, please. Um, will AI render lawyers obsolete? I don't think so. I think that AI is going to shift our focus. It's going to, if anything, increase opportunity. Look back at that list that I provided and think about all of the opportunity in, um, for lawyers in those circumstances. But it did require lawyers to think creatively and to anticipate these new potential problems that arise when they're representing their clients. So thank you, Professor Ianello. I will pass it back to you there. Thank you, uh, Professor Sigurd. That was a very instructive and illustrative presentation. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's just a kind of a, a, a quick question um, uh, for you. I mean, uh, you mentioned that we as attorneys must be more more creative. Uh, do you have any suggestion? A lot of people here, I know that are students on the online online program. So um, any suggestion for achieve that creativity? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I really like using ChatGPT and, and Lexus AI for it is just for me to brainstorm and for me to think like, okay, have I really thought through everything that I should have on this issue? Um, you know, it used to be, you know, I would Google something and, and I would come where I would get on Lexus and I would look at a bunch of cases to kind of double check my work to see, are there any other interesting novel arguments that I could make? Um, can I look at other areas of the law to analogize and perhaps um, argue for an extension of the law, but AI is kind of helping us to short circuit that process a little bit. Um, and then I think when it when it comes to more on the business side of things, you know, how can we leverage AI to help our clients, but also at the same time say there could be potential problems here too. And I, I think a lot about right now creating potentially inadvertent agency relationships um, through AI. If I and as a principal and putting this AI out there in the world to talk with people, to do business with people. Am I putting out this agent, this 
um, this essentially an employee on behalf of my company who's out there doing business on my behalf. And I don't know it exactly what it's going to do because it's constantly learning like a human would. And so these are the interesting, um, fun topics I think right now that we should all be thinking about. Thank you very much for that. That was a, a very interesting answer. Um, well, right now I would like to, um, after thanking again, Professor Seeger, that was a, a great presentation. I, I would like to turn to the next section of today's webinar that is uh, related with other aspects of legal practice. Today we have two vice presidents, legal counsel of two financial institutions, uh, Felicitas Chauro and Monica Hayes. Felicitas Chauro is vice president and uh, legal counsel at JP Morgan, and Monica Hayes um, is a former as a, a online online student, she's a graduate of our of our program, um, and right now she's working at the Benepe Pakriva. Um, I will give the floor right now to uh, uh, Felicitas. Um, so Felicitas, I will share your screen in a minute. Thank you, Pablo. Hi, yes. everyone. Thank you for having me today. Oh, Pablo, I wait for you to present. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, as Pablo was saying, I'm Felicita Chauro. I'm a VP in JP Morgan. Actually, I work in the litigation department. So my presentation today is gonna be uh, focused mainly on my experience as a litigator. So I would like to start with a disclaimer, and it's that if more than 10 years ago when I started law school, someone would tell me that I was going to uh, be today giving a presentation on AI and the legal profession, I probably wouldn't have believed it. Um, I think maybe in the past we thought that AI was going to be this kind of robot reading our minds. I think at some point that will happen, but not um, today. So I didn't start as an expert in AI. I just started working as the years went by and being more involved and seeing that AI is part of my life as a litigator. And I think that AI today is not like the future, AI is the present. So as lawyers, it's ine inevitable for us to be, um, to start learning about AI, start working with it and not being afraid to it. So I think that for big companies, there were two main events that changed the legal uh, industry as a whole, I think especially for big companies. I think the first one was the 2008 financial crisis um, because it changed the way companies uh, saw their expenses. Uh, it went, it focused more on reducing costs, making resources more uh, effective. And that of course uh, introduced technology um, to our legal profession. We all know that legal fees are very high. So it's a, one of the main focuses of companies to reduce um, legal fees. The other and most recent event was the COVID-19 pandemic that almost forced all of us to become digital technology. Actually, I'm today on Zoom. I actually sit in Argentina, so technology is allowing me uh, to be today. And probably before COVID, uh, things were harder. And everyone had to go digital in COVID, like even courts. So everything, everything is now online. And so I think those were the two events that introduced AI and other technologies to our profession. And how companies achieved this, um, I think uh, mainly it was uh, 10 years ago where legal departments started hiring not only lawyers, but other professionals, such as engineers, data analysts, um, economists, to make sure that um, technology is being introduced, resources are being better managed. And you have to think that these are entire teams that are fully dedicated to make legal departments more efficient. So I think that's uh, key to understand uh, how a uh, legal profession is changing today. And actually in, in the department that I work for, I would say that half of the department are lawyers, but the other half are legal professionals who are focused on uh, implementing technology in our profession. So I will now, uh, thanks uh, Pablo, I will now um, mention some of the uses that I've been seeing throughout the years that I've been working at JP Morgan. One would probably be the analysis and draft of legal documents. Uh, 
I think we are starting with more basic um, drafting of documents. We all know that each case, each litigation, each complaint is different. And of course, we can have the same uh, template for everything. But we do have some patterns on the type of um, complaints that we get. Um, the other um, thing would probably be cost prediction. So right now, we are able to determine with um, certain information uh, how much a litigation is going to cost us, depending whether we hire X law firm, Y law firm. So that's really useful for us to be more efficient and make sure we are making uh, the proper analysis before retaining outside counsel. Um, another uh, use that I, I haven't seen it yet internally, but I know that I think Westlaw is working on this and it's result prediction. And this is, I made some testings and it's really interesting. This is typing up the name of a judge, typing up certain information and getting data on how the judge ruled, uh, how it's like, how, and that helps us to better plan your strategy. And I think that right now we really rely on like outside counsel telling us, oh yes, I did work with this judge. Oh, I know this court is pro consumer, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, that's coming and that's really interesting. Um, another thing to consider um, where technology is being used is e-discovery. This, I think these were, uh, people in discovery were the pioneers to introduce technology uh, to the legal profession. Um, for everyone who's involved in litigation, discovery is a huge process that involves thousands and tons of documents. And now with technology, it's also, um, I don't know, uh, recordings, emails, and everything. So being able to identify which documents are important. And also, we, as lawyers, like to, uh, I don't know, like give our counterparty a ton of discovery so that they are uh, spending hours and days reviewing documents. Um, but this is also helping us uh, to better identify which documents are relevant, which our, uh, which our strategy should be, and which documents are not relevant. And this is also saving people hours and days of work. Um, so I think that's probably another aspect very uh, interesting. And finally, and this is not something uh, also that I think it's internal, but I think that this uh, will happen and it's already happened, which is dispute resolution and having AI as a judge. I don't know, I think that's gonna, once that happens, it's gonna be pretty interesting. Um, so, Pablo, could we move to the next slide? Thank you. So, um, which are the, uh, the main advantages that I've seen in the past or I see actually in the present on introducing um, AI to uh, my work? Probably the easiest one is efficiency. Um, I have managed a big uh, team of lawyers and what we've been doing is automating uh, manual tasks and where we have claims with involving several um, customers, several information that helps us uh, to better identify and become quicker and make sure we uh, comply with our deadlines. So probably efficiency and better use of resources um, is one of the key uh, advantages of AI. Then of course, this is, I think, a tied up to time and cost efficiency. This means that uh, you have you, we, you may need less resources or you have your, your resources better allocated to do a deeper analysis. Although I use AI, I like to review the like the results that AI gives us just to make sure things are right. And it allows us to get better conclusions than spending days and days reading uh, documents or looking for information. And the last thing that I think it's, it's one of the advantages of uh, interesting AI is data management. If you have data available, that will help, uh, help you to reduce costs, to uh, improve your strategy and many other things. So I think those are some of the advantages. There are other, but I just wanted to point out these four. Next slide, Pablo, please. So last night, actually, I have to be honest, when I was preparing my presentation, I saw that I included disadvantages, but probably the word would be challenges, but I had already sent my uh, slides to Pablo, so it was too late. Um, so probably with the challenges uh, of AI, introducing AI to the legal profession, our difficulties in adoption. Uh, as lawyers, we are not very uh, known as to like changes and being super 
um, innovative. So probably uh, making people uh, better use these resources that we have available has been a challenge and it's one of our, I think one of our priorities, making sure people um, use the technology that we have. And this is probably tied up to the fact that a lot of people don't know how these technologies work or don't know how to use it, or they are afraid, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, is this a robot who's gonna read my mind or is just, you know, teaching a program to search for certain information or to identify certain things. Then another challenge, and I think maybe this will be touched uh, by other panelists, is attorney-client privilege. Once you introduce technology to uh, whatever you're looking for or whatever you're working on, you have to make sure that attorney-client privilege is being respected and it's being uh, it's not being broken. So I think that's very important. And the other challenge, and I think the last one, is the lack of data. Uh, even though courts became digital and filing now doesn't require for someone to go to court, this is something that I think started maybe five to 10 years ago. So if you want to go and get uh, older information, it's going to be tougher. And also I think that one particular thing about the US um, system is that there are very few trials and a lot of settlements. And most of the settlements are done outside of court. So it's hard to get uh, information on uh, settlements. So I think those are the main challenges. Um, by the time we turn to the next slide. So um, I included a um, case study, uh, which is not related to litigation, but I thought it was interesting since I work at JP Morgan. For anyone who wants to read, JP Morgan implemented a system for contract review, which is called COIN. You can just type it up in Google and you'll find a lot of articles about it, but I just wanted to, to for everyone to have it. So I think um, that's all I had for today. Um, I th I um, also think the same as Professor Sager. I don't think AI will replace us lawyers, but it will definitely change our profession and it will help us to uh, become better lawyers. Um, so I think that's all. Uh, thank you everyone for having me. Pablo, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Felicitas, for, for being with us today and for, for your time. Um, I will pose a, a very big question to you, uh, which is usually kind of a usual similar to the one that I posed to other colleagues. But since you are working as, an, um, as a counsel uh, at a very large firm, uh, if you have to give an advice to students and people starting their, their careers for uh, studying and they want to get involved in this, which would be your advice considering your your expertise and what you mentioned that at the very beginning of your careers, you had no idea that this was part of your life and now it's it's a fact. Sure, so I think probably um, learning and making sure you are aware of what's going on, making sure you get trained on AI. Um, I think it was like three years ago when I started I, I had a mentor and I asked him like, I want to be different. I want to be a better lawyer. How can I be different from everyone else? Can I, how can I think about the future? And he was like, you should start, you know, learning about technology. And that's where I started a master's degree in business and technology. And that gave me that class that maybe not all lawyers have. I may not be an expert in, I don't know, I maybe have, I should have pursued a master's in finance, but I decided to uh, do something related to technology because I wanted to uh, be able to make a difference and make sure, you know, to raise up my hand and say, hey, I know how to do it. I know how to implement this process. And I think that's probably my advice is get trained, get, make sure you are using it, make sure you are updated and make sure you volunteer when these kind of uh, opportunities come in. Thank you so much. That's a very helpful uh, answer. Uh, with this, I will turn the floor to uh, Monica, also a practitioner in a financial institution, um, and, and our friend of the house, Monica, too. Uh, so, uh, Monica, please, the, the floor is yours whenever you want to. We are ready. Sure. Thank you, Professor Pablo. And hi, everyone. Thank you for having me again. It's such a pleasure to to be here collaborating with the University of Dayton and seeing so many familiar faces. Um, as 
Professor Pablo mentioned and Margaret as well. I am a former student of the program and now working for BNP Paribas as a senior um, VP for data privacy and cyber NIP. So dealing with um, you know matters related to AI and tech law in a daily basis. I just wanted to share with you something that I've been seeing in my current practice, which was mentioned by Felicitas, uh, and I'm sure it's common for many other big and global institutions. It's uh, trying to make uh, the tasks that us lawyers do on a daily basis more efficient and contract review certainly is one of them. I'm part of an AI lab uh, prototype or hackathon, whatever you want to call it, to come up with a tool that could identify and help our, our third-party management process with vendors um, identifying gaps in our current agreements. So we're trying to uh, train or two, and that's the advantage that was mentioned by other panelists, that uh, this revolution is related to having the ability to have a machine comprehend data, so which was exclusive for us humans. And now we may be able to rely on a machine to do certain of the mental tasks. That's the big revolution that we're seeing. Before we saw revolutions that were related to manual tasks, tasks that didn't include the mental part of it. So uh, the fact that we now can train a machine to look at an agreement and tell me, hey, you're missing the data privacy standard language that you need for this agreement because this vendor will process personal data. It's, it's what's going to put us ahead of time and give us that efficiency because as of today, we would need our attorneys um, or the compliance team, someone asked a question about how this would impact compliance. So we would have the data office or the compliance teams looking at those agreements and reading hundreds of agreements and not knowing exactly what language would be needed to be in that agreement for that specific relationship with the vendor. So it's not just a matter of having a tool um, reading through an agreement and picking up some attributes of data it's a tool that can comprehend the relationship of the vendor and then understanding the language that we have here, it's not enough. We have a gap and they raise raising a flag and then we would have an attorney doing this fine tuning and this final review. So we are still gonna be needed, no need to for anybody to be worried as Professor Pablo mentioned and Professor Sager also mentioned, I don't think as attorneys will be um, you know, eliminated from the workforce, uh, by all means, uh, we are going to be needed to train the tools. That's what I'm doing today. We're going to be needed to review the results of the tools uh, and come up with solutions for the problems that the tools are going to bring to us, right? So we're not going to be able to rely on the tools to give us solutions. We're going to be the ones being creative and, and finding those solutions. Um, we're also working with our business desks and trying to leverage that capability of the large language models to understand data, to make their work also easier, to come up with you know, uh, data sets more efficiently, to serve our clients in a better way. Um, from a legal perspective, it's, it's interesting that for my internal clients, I have questions and why are you not using AI in my favor? So that's something that us all attorneys need to have in mind and not be afraid of the new technology and really try to make the best use for our clients and make sure that we are uh, obviously within compliance with all the laws and regulations, especially us in the financial sector, we're heavily regulated, so there's not you know, a lot of jiggle room, but make sure that we are using the novelties in favor of our clients, because this is good practice, right? That's why we are hired to do the best for our clients. And that will definitely include the use of AI. So um, from my perspective and my uh, practice, uh, apart from the contracts, which is something that we have been working on, we're also working on a separate tool 
for uh, summarizing new laws and regulations. So on data privacy and cyber, we're having new laws and regulations each day. Like in the United States, you can you probably if you're not from the this specific area, you see in the news every day we have new laws re related to tech. So uh, obviously, I cover North America too, like Tim. So it's a lot. Even relying on tools from like Solid or eSphere or other tools, uh, it's really hard because you need to analyze this new law will be in scope for my institution. How does it impact us? So we're training a tool internally to be able to do that for us. And, you know, it's going to do, it's going to scrap the web, search for new laws and regulations compared to the attributes that we're training, which is what's relevant for us as an institution. We're a foreign bank operating in New York and in the United States. So we have several, you know, different types of, um, um, types of uh, business lines that we have in the US. So how is this new law and new regulation going to impact us? You Now it's done manually by us, my team, but we're trying to have that first review of those new laws done by an, a tool. So that's gonna be also very helpful for us. Then we can focus only on those regulations and laws that are actually applicable to us and not spend a lot of time a lot of committees, a lot of meetings, just to come up and say, oh yes, we're out of scope. We can just forget about this one. Let's work up now in New Hampshire, or you know, let's look at Connecticut data privacy law and see if it's for us. So, so that's what I have for you all today. I don't wanna take much of the time. I know we have a lot of interesting things coming up after me. Uh, as always, feel free to reach out to me if you all have any questions. Back to you, Professor Pablo. Thank you, Monica. Uh, sure. Thank you for, for sharing uh, your views. Just uh, um, really quickly, I mean, uh, consider all the experience you have gained on this, uh, which which uh, have been the major challenges that you have you have faced in the, in the institution you're working. If, I don't know if you can share some of the challenges that you as a practitioner have seen. Right, personally for me, um... I think it's the lack of the tech knowledge. So um, we have the legal knowledge, but not always we'll know what goes behind the scenes. So it has been very helpful to sit with the AI lab, with the IT people, and really try to learn what's behind the coding, what we need to teach the AI, why it will respond in a certain way. So if I could advise anyone is to try to get at least the basics of the technology, uh, that will really help you uh, give better legal advice in the end, right? Not just make use of the tools, but also give better legal advice if you know the basics. So I've I've been trying here and there to get some certifications and do like I did a, um, I think I was a e Cornell program. I, no, it was a Harvard program online. There was um, LOMs for attorneys. So explaining code and all the tech you know, behind the scenes. So that's that's helpful. And that's definitely a challenge if you're not coming from an IT tech background. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that sure. was really helpful. And with this, I will turn the floor to uh, Professor Margaret uh, Ionidis that uh, she will have a, a great conversation for sure with Professor Tabu. Margaret, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo. And wow, thanks to all of the presenters, uh, Nick, Felicitas, Monica. I mean, this has just been an incredible discussion. And for everyone who's joining us, thank you for taking the time to do that. Our last presenter today uh, is Professor Tamara Tabo. She actually teaches the professional responsibility course for our JD students at University of Dayton. Uh, she and Professor Seeger also graciously recorded a guest interview on the subject of AI and legal ethics, and that will be included in our professional responsibility course and the online LLM program this summer. So we were hoping, Professor Tabo, if you could share some of your insights regarding the ethical and professional responsibility obligations that U.S. attorneys should maintain and keep in mind when using these emerging technologies. 
Sure, absolutely. And I will go ahead and uh, share my screen here quickly. I am very excited to get to talk with you guys about uh, this particular set of, of issues. So much of what the uh, the presenters before me have said uh, perked me up because uh, I, I see, as with many things, the sort of professional ethical implications of uh, virtually anything. Um, as some of you may know, if you are practicing as a U.S. attorney, you are in one way or another going to be governed by the American Bar Association's model rules of professional conduct. Now, I sort of say one way or another because most state bars have adopted the model rules from the ABA, but there are occasionally some sort of, you know, state differences, as I think most of us uh, come to see frequently when it comes to different jurisdictions. But the model rules from the American Bar Association Association do set out a number of duties placed on all lawyers, and a number of these are going to be directly implicated by some of the exciting things that we're seeing with, uh, with AI. And probably top of mind for uh, a lot of folks are the closely related duties of competence and diligence. So without going too far into the weeds of the, uh, of the model rules, basically competence as laid out uh, by the American Bar Association involves as an attorney, creating a situation for yourself where you are only entering into representation of clients when you can do so with the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation necessary for that particular task. And closely related to that is uh, the rules regarding diligence. So I always like to tell my students, if you think of competence as that legal knowledge and skill and the ability to represent your client well, then you can kind of think of diligence as uh, the duty to follow up on that, to actually, you know, sort of promptly comply, be responsive to your client and uh, do all the hard work that you're capable of doing. Now, when AI enters the scene, uh, unfortunately, there are a number of ways that we can potentially see lawyers falling short of the duties of competence and diligence. And you may be privy to some of the high profile cases that we've uh, seen in the last year or so. Um, one in particular in uh, federal court in New York involved a couple of uh, rather seasoned attorneys who uh, made the unfortunate mistake of relying on AI, specifically ChatGPT to uh, do some legal research for them. And uh, it turns out that they uh, cited to the court, uh, federal court, uh, cases that did not in fact exist. And uh, these particular attorneys uh, got into quite a bit of trouble with that, as you might imagine, certainly not bringing to bear all that they should be doing in order to uh, thoroughly uh, do the work in order to represent their, uh, their clients well. We've seen even recently some other sort of high profile cases, uh, Michael Cohen, the former lawyer for uh, for former President Trump, uh, he too, even though he is now disbarred, uh, he, uh, he actually uh, sort of fed legal information to his current attorneys that once again was unfortunately based on uh, erroneous information that was gathered from ChatGPT. Now, I like to point out here that it's not implausible, and this is what um, all of these attorneys have, have argued in their own defense, it's not implausible that they simply did not understand how generative AI tools like ChatGPT work. So they thought that it was like a search engine. They thought that it was like a legal database and that only reliable information would be produced by these tools. As we know, generative AI ha is prone on occasion to what we refer to as hallucinations, right? It makes up stuff that sounds plausible. And so a part of what I think is a cautionary tale here on an ethical level is that not understanding the particular technology that you're employing is often where attorneys are going to get into trouble with these kinds of tools. 
I point it out in that particular way, in part because I think that we really are dealing with something of a double-edged sword here when it comes to the ethical implications of using AI. Because even though we can imagine these situations in which it is a violation of an attorney's ethical duties to use AI in a particular way, it may also be the case, and I predict that it will be the case in uh, in the coming years, that failing to use AI appropriately appropriately may actually also run afoul of our duties to competently and diligently represent our clients. So, you know, if you consider, for example, and uh, again, we've, we've heard sort of allusions to this earlier in the presentations, if someone is drafting an argument on behalf of their client, knowing that they could bounce ideas off of some of these AI tools, they could generate opposing arguments, they could get good ideas about how they themselves might strengthen the work that they're doing for their client, failing to do that may actually mean that they're not being completely thorough in their preparation. So again, I think that it uh, it can cut both ways. Now, one of the other big areas where I think that we're uh, seeing ethical implications of AI tools has to do with confidentiality and attorney-client privilege, closely related concepts. And part of what I want to point out here is that when the American Bar Association lays out our confidentiality duties as attorneys, it is not only you know preventing us from gossiping about our clients, it's actually insisting that we take reasonable steps as attorneys to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of our clients' information. And this is one of the reasons why data security policies and the duties that surround that are uh, something that you know the ABA has already contemplated. Most attorneys, uh, you know, in in private practice, have been thinking about these things. We can't simply assume whether you know even without AI being in the picture, we can't simply assume that every tool that we use is going to actually be keeping our clients' information private. And once again, I think that you can certainly imagine in the age of generative AI, where a novice attorney or one who is novice with respect to the technology will assume that uh, when they are, they are interacting with some of these AI tools, that there's no potential data security issues. Part of what I think is interesting is that uh, even just in the last year or so, since we've really been in this generative AI uh, revolution, uh, many of the, you know, sort of the AI platforms, uh, OpenAI, which is responsible for ChatGPT, for example, have opened up uh, enterprise level uh, licensing for their tools, where a business, a law firm, a corporation can buy a license that allows their clients, allows those individuals to use those tools with greater data privacy measures in place than when you or I pop into uh, ChatGPT and start uh, entering our information. So already, even just in less than a year, we've started started to see how these things have uh, evolved, adapted in light of, among other things, the need for us to maintain the privacy of information of the clients that we're, that we're dealing with. The last thing that I'll mention before uh, turning it back over to, uh, to the, the whole group for some Q&A is reasonable fees. We have a duty to uh, only charge our clients reasonable fees. And the way that the ABA defines that means that we need to be taking into account the actual time and labor involved in completing whatever task we're charging our clients for. And as some of the uh, other folks have mentioned, there are a lot of efficiencies that come from using AI tools. So just like we would think that there's probably something a little unethical if an attorney, you know, old school back in the day said, I'm never going to use Westlaw or Nexus or any kind of, of online database, not going to touch any of that stuff. I love to go to the library and do all of my legal research in paper print books. We would probably say, hey, that's not fair to be charging an hourly rate to your client that reflects this antiquated way of doing these basic legal tasks. 
definitely imagine a time in the not so distant future when uh, because of AI tools uh, efficiencies, it actually becomes a violation of a duty to charge only reasonable fees not to use some of these potential tools. So all that to say, I think that uh, we do live in a very exciting age in terms of uh, what all of this means for uh, legal practice. And so I'm excited to uh, hear any questions that, that you guys may have. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Pablo and Margaret. Thank you, Tamara. That was fantastic. And I think that kind of brings everything full circle. With that, um, we will go ahead and stop the recording and open up the live Q&A. Uh, before I stop the recording, I just wanted to say a final thank you again to all of the panelists and uh, Professor Pablo, amazing job moderating the entire discussion. So uh, for those of you who are listening to this recording all the way through to the end, thanks for staying with us. And with that, I will stop the recording and we can open up the Q&A.